surrounded me and I love it. <laughs> so I just want to encourage you to say yes to Jesus and yes to baptism. <clears throat> All right. Well, good morning. You can say good morning back if you want. It's, just, it's like one of those things where I, if, you, it's, if you look at the mirror and go, good morning, no one says anything back, but you're not the mirror. Hey, by the way, I just, you know, Chris kind of was very generous with um, kind of uh, his introduction of me, but I want you to know right off the bat, you can't blame me for who he is, all right? Um, it's not my fault, all right? Um, no, I love Chris and Hannah. Um, Chris and I were talking about, um, he, he pointed out one person in here, like you right back there, said he's one of my top five guys I was ever in my youth ministry. And um, Chris is definitely on that list for me. Um, I love being here. I've got to share with Lincoln Heights. Gosh, I don't know how, I mean, I, mean I, I've been, I think the first time I came and shared was Chris's first year here. And, um, and I think I've just been able to be a part of, you know, what's going on here in just a little bit. And it's my pleasure to be here today. Um, I want to start off, it's it, June um, 15, 2021. Uh, my wife and I went uh, on a first trip to Maui um, and uh, for a vacation, something we'd want to do for a long time. Our, our daughter and, um, and the guy she married, uh, no, her, my, I love my son-in-law, uh, and, and my grandkids were there as well. Um, and it was the last day. And uh, last full day, we were going to leave the, the following day. We get basically got all the eggs and the bacon and stuff that was left, and we ate it all, okay? Um, uh, we we're not going to leave anything behind. Uh, we went for this really beautiful drive. Uh, the beginning parts of the road to Hana, it was just gorgeous. Uh, we didn't want to do the whole thing because we were going to be meeting our daughter and, and her family at the beach. But on the way, as we passed this one little... Um, I don't know, what, what even what to call it. It looked like a jungle. I mean, it was a short little walk, about maybe 200 yards to the beach. But you were walking through these trees that were just, I mean, it, it, you would think that this is where Disney got, um, you know, vision for some of the things that they have put in their movies. It was just gorgeous. And, and uh, taking pictures. And even there was like this chicken and chicks that were there. And they, they began to, the chicks, like two of them were following my wife. I just, we felt like someone's going to start singing Akuna Makata just any moment. It was just kind of this cool, cool little time. And uh, we got back in the car and we, we were just talking about, you know, just what a wonderful trip it was. And, and we pulled up to the beach and, and we started walking down on the beach and, and we, see, we see our daughter and her family were waving to them. And all of a sudden my wife grabs her head and she's like, ah, and she, she's experiencing pain. So we sat down and, and, and what we didn't know was that at that moment, our lives were going to be drastically changed forever. Um, my wife suffered a major brain hemorrhage uh, at that moment on the beach. Um, she uh, got to the hospital, the doctors there, um, all three of them, uh, none of them felt like she would last more than a day. And uh, praise God, that's not true. And, um, and so it was um, a whirlwind. Uh, my daughter and, and, and a friend of ours put together a GoFundMe at that time. And I mean, I didn't know it. I had seen GoFundMes, but really um, had never, um, my mind was in other places and I wasn't thinking about this. And a couple days later, she goes, Dad, look. And, and there was like eight or $9,000 in there. And I, just thought, I, I, I couldn't believe that people would give, you know, money towards us. I mean, our, our bills were going to be big. And our recovery time was going to be um, long. And, but that was just a drop in the tens of thousands of dollars that came into us from over 350 people. Um, the largest donation was $5,000 for my, for my nephew or my niece and, and her husband. Um, the smallest was $5 for one of my junior high students that I had the, the, the year before. And from between there, there were um, countless, um, um, like I said, um, gifts, one from Lincoln Heights Christian Church. And, um, and it, the generosity that was expressed to us there, not just through money, but through prayers and notes and letters and so many things, and I'm not, I'm not exaggerating, it, it changed me. It did. It had an impact on me that, that is still here today. And um, so when I say I love Lincoln Heights, I, I mean that from a very sincere uh, heart in a very real way, okay? So let's pray together 
as, as we get into today. Father, we love you. And when we think about generosity, Father, I, I, there is no one greater than you when it comes to being generous to us. From your grace and your forgiveness and your mercy to your love and, and, and the gifts that you give us, the blessings that you bring in our lives, the people you bring into our lives, the impact that people have on us and the blessing of us being able to have an impact on others. Father, you're, uh, you are the true definition of what it means to be generous. And as we talk about that here today, Father, I pray that you would just um, help us to, uh, to open our hearts to you and to, be, and to open our eyes to you and, 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 and allow you to say to us what you want to say to us. And thank you for me being able to be a part of this process today. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. So when Christopher said, yeah, I want you to pray, I want you to talk about generosity, I'm like, great, you want me to talk about money, okay, that's exactly, yeah, coward, uh, but, it, it, but the reality is generosity is not about money, it's just not, I mean, money can be a part of generosity, there's no doubt about that, okay, but ge generosity I I is a deeper thing, and it really deals with who we are, um, not the act of what we do, because the act of what we do comes from what's inside, um, and, and that guides who we are and what we do, so Looking up generosity, I thought I'd just get a good definition. And so this is generosity. Um, liberal in giving, lavish, bountiful, and it carries, and this is the part that really grabbed me and really kind of guided kind of where we're going to go today. It says, and it, it, it carries the heart and the action of being open-handed. See, sometimes a gift, here, okay, and, and, and when, we, when we hold on to our wallets and we give here, we're, we're like this and like this at the same time. And the idea of, of, um, of being generous is this, just here. This is, if you need this, this is yours. And, um, uh, and, and so I want to talk about being open-handed generous today. Um, again, it's not about an amount, it's not about where or what we do, but it all starts with who we are. In fact, you know, the amount doesn't even matter. In fact, Jesus told us, and we read a story in the Gospels where Jesus is at a, um, basically at his church, and, and, um, and people were giving their, their, their offerings. And there were some very wealthy people giving very small percentages of what they had. And people were like, wow, look how much you're giving. And they had a, 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 an elderly woman who just came and gave two, basically two pennies. And Jesus goes, she gave much more than any of the rest of these because it was a sacrifice of everything she had. And so, so when God looks at us, he's not looking at us at a mount. He's looking at our hearts and who we are and what we're doing. Um, you know, um, not long ago, I was having a conversation with some guys, um, and we were talking about um, in our community, they began to grow. I'm a teacher, by the way. I teach seventh grade science, and um, some people say, I'll pray for you. You don't have to. You pray for the kids. They have me, all right? And, and I love seventh graders. I love who they are at that time of their lives. I, I love being a part of this big transition in their lives. And um, I was talking to some teachers, and, and they were talking about how in our community, the homeless population was kind of getting larger. And, um, and I said, yeah, it's a great opportunity for us. And he's like, I don't know what you mean by that. And, and I said, well, we have right in front of us a lot of people who have some needs. And, um, and w this is a wealthy community. There's a lot of money here, and we have an opportunity maybe to have some impact on their lives. And the guy's like, you, Dave, you got this all wrong. I mean, if they're there, they're there on their own choices. They decided that road. I go, I don't think they decided that they wanted to be, be, kind of be where they're at, but they found themselves there. And he's like, no, see, this is the thing. If they made a decision, if they made choices and it landed them there, then that's their fault. They needed to get, dig themselves out. Not us. It's not up to us. And that is one mindset. And that is one way of looking at somebody or a situation saying, hey, this, even if you're not homeless, say, well, you got yourself here. This is, or you didn't prepare. There's all kinds of things that we can do in terms of looking at someone and, and in looking at situations. And, but, but what God says I want you to do is I want you to have a heart for those around you. I want you to have a heart of generos generosity. Or I've talked to some people. One guy says, you know, sometimes I just look around and it's like, I don't know what to do. I just don't know what to do. And, you know, as a teacher, I, on, my, on my wall in my classroom, I have four levels of, of, of understanding. Uh, number one, I, I, 
I, I, don't, I don't understand yet. Number two is, you know, I, I, feel, I feel like I'm almost there, but I need more clarification, more practice, maybe something like that. Three, um, I've got it and I can do it, which is a great place to be if you're learning something, right? I got it. And four is, I got it and I think I can help someone else get it. And, and we go through exercises, but the, the first one is, and there's, n- there's nothing wrong with being in any of the four things, because anytime we learn something new, we're number one. I don't, I don't understand it yet, but the key word there is yet, because you will. You will get it. You just don't have it yet. So if sometimes we enter into situations and we're looking at it, it's like, I just don't know what to do in this situation. I don't know what to do with what's right in front of me. It's okay. It's just you don't understand yet. But God's going to reveal that to you. He's going to help you to know what to do. He's going to guide you into what to do. And I hope that even today, maybe this will help you even a little bit within that process. And so as, as I look at this, there's going to be a few keys, I think, in understanding some generosity and, and, and how, what we see in Scripture. And, and the first key is, no, that's not there. This is way back here. I don't see what's on the, on the screen. Yeah, there we go. The uh, first key to um, open-handed generosity is awareness. Just being aware of what's going on around us. Um, so what are we aware of? Man, there was a time in, in just in my lifetime, okay, I just turned 59 this last, uh, last month, and um, in my life where what you were aware of was just basically where you lived, where you worked, where you went to school, the community you lived in, the neighborhood you lived in, because that was kind of, I mean, we heard about things happening in other places on news, or things, but really what we were aware of, what was around us, what was going on in our world. We all live in our own worlds, because the worlds that we each live in are the people that are comprised are the people that we interact with, and it's unique for each of us. So we all live in a little bit different world than everyone else, and our, ours, you know, kind of go on top of each other right now, but... Um, that was what we were aware of. Now, because of this, I mean, we can, we're aware of everything all over the world. Not only that, we get to hear about everyone's opinions about everything that's going on all over the world. And, and, and have you ever been in a place, like a restaurant and stuff, and, 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 and you sit down, you look around, and you can see people at a table all like this? You guys ever experienced that before? Have you ever been one of those? I have, okay, where everyone's like this. Not even seeing what's happening just down here. Um, I, I was driving to work um, uh, to the school uh, just a couple weeks ago, and I was passing kids who were walking, and all of them were walking like this, okay, with phones in their hands and their faces down. And, and you know, part of the issue, part of the thing that is, there's a lot of good to that, there's a lot of negative to that, but part of the thing is, is that so often we're no longer aware of what's going on around us. Our eyes are not up. Seeing the people, seeing situations, being open to maybe what we can um, see, what we can do with what's right in front of us. And um, like I said, I hear people say, I don't know what to do. But, you know, I'll bet if you were to think about your life and what your experiences have been, there have been all kinds of examples around you of people who did things that were incredibly generous. And maybe we just didn't look at them that way. You know, being a pastor um, for over 30 years, I mean, I've, I've, have many, uh, I've loved many things about doing that. Um, and and you, we get to do a lot of fun stuff like weddings, but, you know, funerals as well. And even though I, I, don't, I, I, I don't like, but I like funerals because to be there with some people who are, who are hurting and, and to help walk them through that is, is just a privilege. Um, but I did my, my father's funeral. And my mother's funeral, but my, my father died um, several years ago. And at his funeral, at, when it was over, um, there was a, several people came and began to tell stories about. And this is the thing, too. Stories about my dad that I, I had no idea about. And my mom. So he came up and she said, I want you to know who your parents were to me. And she said, you know, <clears throat> 10 or 12 years ago. Um, and she was probably in her mid Forties at this point, so she was she was in her thirties, and and she goes, my husband was going in for a surgery. It was going to be a long surgery. It was a scary surgery. We were both worried. There's a chance he may not survive the surgery, and and I, I asked for some prayer and some things, and I don't even know how. I went. I took my my my, my husband, the doctor. They got prepped, and I had to go out to the waiting room. When I walked out to the waiting room. She goes, your parents were just sitting there, and they go, oh my gosh, you're here. Who are you here for? And they said, you. 
we're here for you. We heard about that, and we thought, oh, she can't be alone. And so they came, and she was, and they, sat, she, they sat with me for seven hours. Seven hours, bought me lunch, talked with me, and sometimes I just needed to be able to just were quiet. And come to find out, my parents, they wouldn't say it was a ministry of theirs. They would just say, they just had a heart for people who were going through. And they, I got heard over and over and over about, hey, they sat with people, going, oh, you're going to surgery? We're there. And, and, and my, my, their house was open to anyone, any group, you know, from, from the church or anywhere. The Boy Scouts had meetings there at times. And, you know, Bible studies were there. I mean, our house was open for my entire life. They were generous. My, my father-in-law says this about, said this about my dad. He said, um, let me tell you about my dad. Now, my father-in-law is 86 years old, and, um, and he really loves to listen to himself talk. And the thing is, at 86, he tells all the same stories over and over and over and over again. And I'm about the only one who talks to him, so when I call him, if you wanted to, I could give you the 15-minute rendition of exactly what I hear every time I talk to him. But one of the things he's started to say lately is, let me tell you about your dad. He goes, the first day we went to Nod Avenue, Nod Avenue Christian Church, the church I grew up in, and uh, where I met my wife, who was his daughter. And, and he said, um, we walked in, we didn't know anyone. Your dad kind of looked at me kind of weird. And, um, and he, ran, he walked over and goes, I'm Dave Sill. What's your name? And he goes, I haven't ever met you before. He goes, what's well, our first time? He goes, your first time, well, come with me. And he goes, and he took me up stairs into this room where there's all kinds of people in our age and he, and he goes he went around and introduced to everyone hey this is jack and billy McElroy. he goes he he introduced us not like it was the first time we met but like we had been friends for years and this became just a a place for fellowship and for love and for serving and stuff my parents were generous i didn't talk anything about money here they were generous with with themselves with time with, with, with welcoming and, um, and that is generosity, seeing the moment, being aware of what's in front of us. And when you feel that little tug, when you feel that little tug, don't pull back from it. When you feel that little tug like, maybe I should walk up to this person. Maybe I should, just go with it and see what happens. Just go with it. See, when we, when we look at what Jesus did and what Jesus didn't do, I mean, we look at Jesus, what Jesus did, but I think about what, th- some things that Jesus didn't do, okay? And what Jesus didn't do is he did not solve the problems of society during his time. Do you know that? He didn't do it. I mean, they were an occupied country. They were an occupied people. The Roman government was in charge. They had their people there. They were overlooking their people. And, they, and the Jewish people, more than anything, wanted to have a, a Messiah come and raise up an army and conquer the, the Romans and just fulfill, you know, go back to the glory days. Jesus did nothing about that. Not a single thing. The church was really, was not in a good place. There was a lot of people that were um, just corrupt, and they had their own ideas. Power was really important to them. Jesus did nothing. Jesus did not solve one single societal problem during his day. What he did do, what he did do was, Jesus met the immediate needs of the people he came in contact with as he was moving through his life. Now, we only have three years of it, but Jesus being Jesus, do you think that he didn't do anything for the first 30 years of his life that it's pretty quiet and it's, that we don't know about? Did he just start doing that when he started his ministry? Do you think that? Absolutely not. Jesus was who Jesus was. He had been doing it his whole life. That's who he was. He couldn't help but do that. And we just don't know all the stories that went on before him. And, you know, um, Jesus healed people. We have the story of the woman who hemorrhaged for seven years, went to doctors, all of her money was spent. I mean, that's probably, I hear stories like that all the time right now. And he healed her. When, when, when people were hurting, he healed them. When people um, <clears throat> were, were being harassed by spirits, he, he freed them. I mean, there was about 10,000 people who needed lunch one day, and he fed them with five loaves and two fish. Now, it was at 5,000, but that was only, it says 5,000 men, but the women and children were there, and probably there was more like 10 to 12,000 people there that he fed. Jesus was aware 
of what was going on. And guys, when we feel that tug, like I said, and we just go with it, what we do is we open the door to allow Jesus to do the same things he did in scripture. Like 10,000 people with five loaves and two fish. Uh, about nine months ago, um, I, I met my son and his family and my wife. We, we went to Starbucks close to our house, and, and we were kind of just just having some time there and just, you know, just having fun and, and um, outside. And, and this man walked by. He was a homeless man. I could tell. And I don't know. I just I felt like I'd seen him around, driving around. And, and so I just kind of, well, I didn't say anything. I just walked away, went over, and just introduced myself. And um, this, his name's Paul. And I said, just talk to me. How are you? I mean, are you okay? I mean, do you need anything? I mean, I, 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 I go much. And he goes, well, I just, I need some socks. I'm kind of hungry. I go, okay, do, do, what, he goes, just anything. I go, well, are you going to be here for a while? And he goes, yeah, I'll stay, I just stay here. I just bought some socks. I ran home, grabbed, I'm taking them out of the package yet. I grabbed my socks. I went in, and I ordered two sandwiches. I go, don't heat them up. Just give me two sandwiches and a grande. I asked him what drink he would like. I got him this grande drink. So I was waiting, and they said, called my name, and they heated up these sandwiches. I'm like, oh. I said, I didn't want these heated up. And she goes, oh. She goes, I'll get you some new ones, but you can just have those. I go, are you sure? She goes, yeah. So I wrapped them, put them in a bag. And then um, uh, another lady came and said, oh, I heard she got a sandwich. She's busy, so here, here's two sandwiches. So I took those and put them in. And then um, she came back. She goes, here's your two sandwiches. She goes, I, I, I accidentally opened them up. I didn't mean to open them up, but I actually opened them up, but I didn't heat them up. But here, I wrapped them in these napkins. And you, I go, oh, sorry, I got them some from someone else. Let me give those to you. She goes, oh, just keep them. So I go in. And then, you know, there's, a, there's grande venti, and there's that one that's bigger than venti. I don't even know what it's called. Do you guys know what it's called? I was hoping someone would yell it out. Anyways, I ordered a grande, and I got that the, the, the <laughs> El Grande, okay, really big one, okay? And, and I'm like, oh, I just ordered a grande. They go, oh, you can have it. So, so I went in there, and God turned my two sandwiches into six and my grande into uh, whatever that huge thing is. And I went, and I go, well, here, Paul. And he goes, well, what's that? And he goes, oh, I have a friend, and, and we can both. And it was like God just did what God was going to do. And I believe God increased the food for him, okay? And I just ordered two sandwiches and a, and a drink, and he got more. And, and, and God wants to do what God wants to do, and he's going to do what he wants to do. And what he, God wants us to do is just to look around and be aware of what's in front of us. I think the second key I want to get to here is, um, is, it, is, is, is having the right sight. Having the right sight. And what I mean by that is, is, um, is to see things in the right way. Because we can be aware of something and look at them with the wrong set of eyes. Now, one of the things that we can do, and, and Scripture even says, in fact, in, in uh, Matthew chapter 25, Jesus t- is talking about a story. Um, he's telling a parable about a king who comes and says, hey, you know, w- w- the day when you go stand before the king, before God, and God says, you know, when I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When I was thirsty, you, you gave me something to drink. I-, I was naked and you clothed me. I-, I-, I was a stranger, you let me in. I was, I was sick and I was in prison. You came and visited me. We're going to say, you know, I don't remember seeing you. I don't remember doing that to you. And, and then he says this, and the king will say, I tell you the truth, you did it to one of the, when you did it to one of the least of these brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. And so, and so the eyes is, if we can look at people and see people and think, okay, this isn't just that person, that this is Jesus, then, then maybe that can help us. And, 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 and it's a good start, isn't it? Isn't it a good start to try to, try to visualize? Try, it's hard. It's not easy to do, okay? But to try to say, okay, we, we want to do it. In fact, Mother Teresa, and I think I even shared this quote the last time I was here, but it's just so fitting. She said, I see Jesus in every, here we go, about here. I see Jesus in every human being. I say to myself, oh, this is hungry Jesus, I must feed him. This is sick Jesus, the, the one um, must be leprosy, gangrene. I, I must wash him and tend to him. Um, I serve because I love Jesus. That's a great start, but it's not perfect, is it? I mean, do we do that all the time? I mean, the people that Jesus was serving at that time, the, 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 the 10,000, 15,000 that he fed, uh, the miracles he performed in front of people, you know, all the, they were the people when at the end they said, do you want this criminal or, or, or Jesus? And say, the criminal crucified Jesus. They were the ones yelling that. And, they, and he did, did it right in front of them. And so, 
And how many of us, since we've become Christians or since we've begun to want to follow God, have done it all right? Always done the right thing. Have, I, have we? Well, right? None of us have, right? It's a good start. It's not perfect, though. See, Jesus wants us to have um, a new sight. You know, in, in, the, in the Sermon on the Mount, I mean, if, and if, if someone asked me that long ago, like, if you could have one section of Scripture, what, script, what would you want? And, and for me, it was the Sermon on the Mount. I go, it's just Jesus' longest sermon. I want that, okay? Because it deals with us. And, and in there, he's, he's trying to help us over and over see to look at things differently. He, he, he says, you know, you've heard that it was said in the law, you know, you shall not commit murder. He goes, but I say, if you have anger in, if, in your heart, if, if, you, if you have hatred in your heart, then, then you, it's already there. You've heard this said, don't commit adultery. He goes, but you have lust in your heart. It's already there. He goes, you need to look at things not just with a law, but with what's going on inside of you. That's what you need to do. That's what you need to look at. So Jesus did not come to, um, to set up new regulations for us. He did not come to give us a, a law. He, he, he wants to see that, that, a, that a changed life is our solution. Him being in us is our solution. See, Jesus did not, let me put this up here for you. Um, oh, I'm a behind. I'm not used to doing this, okay? I'm going too far now. Anyways, here we go. Let me just say this. Jesus didn't abolish or fulfill the old law to set up a new law for us now. See what laws are for? Laws are for to tell you how low you can go until you're okay. You go beyond this, then you're in trouble. That's what a law does. Okay? It's all about don't do this. If you go to this level, you're okay, but don't go low. But isn't that, as, as a youth pastor, I would have kids always say, Mr. Uh, Dave, can, can, how, if, if I do this, am I okay? Or, or, you know, here's the line, if I'm here, am I okay? Because for some reason we think, oh, being as close as we can to sin is the funnest place to live, okay? This is okay, right? Am I okay? And, 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 and that's, that's fuzzy, that brings a fuzzy vision, when we're operating that way. It's, it's not, can I do something and be okay? What Jesus wants to do is to say, no, I want you to have something where there is no law against that. In fact, he even says in, in, in Galatians 5, when he talks about the fruit of the Spirit in us, he goes, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. He goes, against such things, there is no law. No law is going to say, you know what, you're being too loving. You can only go a limit with that love. You can't go beyond that. You got jo joy? Come on, come on. You, got, you can't have that much joy, only this much. I mean, there's no law that's going to say you can't love. You can't have joy. You can't have too much peace. You need a little more anxiety in your life. Come on. I mean, there's no laws against these things. Allowing those things to say, if I can get as close to Jesus and become more like him, that is what I want. That is what I need. And I'm looking up and I can't believe that I don't have that much time. All right, I'm okay. See, Jesus did things backwards in his time. Kings during this time would want people to love them because ultimately they were going to use them, sacrifice them to get what they wanted. Jesus, the king of kings, loved us so much that he sacrificed himself. He's always done things differently. He's always been different in the way that he operates. So let me just say this the third key is this. Is open-handed generosity it is all about your heart. It's all about your heart. You know, did you know that the word church isn't in the Bible in the original language? It's not there. The, the church that we at Ecclesia is just gathering it would be like the gathering of people in, 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 in Galatia, the gathering of the followers of Jesus, or actually what they called themselves is the followers of the way, the people of the way. That's what they called themselves. So the gathering of the way, okay, in this location. Jesus, I am the way, the truth, the life. And they go, yeah, he's the way. So we're the people of the way. I like that kind of, I, I like that. We're the people of the way. And um, as people of a new way of thinking, of people of a new way of living, of people of a new way of responding to what's in front of us, 
I want to encourage you with just three things, okay? I'm going to go over just a little bit, okay? Which has never happened to me before. Um, but I, I'm, I'm going to do this. <clears throat> of this new way, God wants us to have a generous heart. And what I mean by that is not just, we need to give our heart to people. We need to share our heart with people. So I'm a teacher, seventh grade teacher. Last year, there's a kid, Chris, who was a part in my, in my classes. And I, Chris is just, a, just an amazing young guy. First, I mean, I just one of those kids, I just, I just love it when he walks in the door every day. And then all of a sudden became friend with this guy who was, you know, not my favorite person. And, um, and, and, and it just, he changed, okay? He just really changed. And it's like, I was sad. I was like, I'm having to, and I, and I didn't become a teacher. I tell him, because I don't become a teacher to bust you. I don't want to do that. But, you know, you get the Mr. Seal you ask for, okay, that you'd be able to ask for. And it was like, I was having to deal with him with issues. And, and I finally said, hey, dude, you got to come in at lunch. You have a lunch tension with me. You're going to do one pager. And kids hate doing this one pager. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but they hate it. But, um, and so he came in. And when he walked in the door, I'm like, I don't want to give him this. I don't want to give him a one pager. And he's sitting there he's all upset. And he just, and he's like, I just go, Chris, how, how are you doing, man? He goes, what? I go, how are you doing? He goes, I don't know. I said, well, I'll tell you how I'm doing. I'm sad. My heart is sad right now. Man, I just, I, I just love, I, I love you, and I, and I care about you, and I look at you, and I just begin to talk about all these really cool things that I like about him. And, you know, in the full first semester, it's great. I don't know what's happened this quarter. It's just like this, there's this, like, huge change, and I'm just sad. You're here. You're here for this. I don't want you here for this. That's not what I want for you. And I was just going to say, but we have this whole other rest of the year. And he goes, Mr. Sill, we have the rest of the year, though. We have the rest of the year. We, 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 we could, we could like, go back. I mean, that's what I, I was just going to say that. And it was like, it just changed. He was just back. Even, even better than before. I just, all I did was just tell him, you know, one of the things that's, that has happened because of this stroke is that it affected her whole right side and her ability to communicate is... is very, very low. And if there's anything I miss, it's her voice. Her voice. And um, part of the reason is because my wife has always had such an amazing gift to disarm people. Just to disarm them with her words. Because she, you know what she would do? She'd just share her own faults. She would just break down. She didn't put, was, there's no false pretenses. She was just like, yeah, this was me. And, and people would just, I can't tell you how many times she came home. I just was talking this lady. She she said, "I've never told anyone. If, if I had a dollar for every time someone said I've never shared this with anyone to my wife, I'd be a wealthy man." It's one thing I love about her. Her words are always generous. Her words are always um, helping people say, "You're safe. You're safe with me." She doesn't say that. It's just who she is that brings that. You know, guys, we need, to be, we need to be generous with our service. One of the last things that Jesus did with his disciples in, um, in John chapter 13, verse 14, and I'm way behind on this, but um, here we go. Look at this, I'm right there. Um, is he washes disciples' feet. Now, understanding this was a common practice, okay, to wash feet. They wore sandals. They wa walked on dirt roads. They would come to a place, and usually there was like a, like a, not a servant servant, maybe a servant, but just someone who was paid, and part of their job was to wash people's feet when they came in. And so someone should have been there washing it, and so they weren't there, and so Jesus goes, it's okay, I'll do it. So he gets out, and he washes 12 pairs of feet of these men. Okay, these are fishermen, these are, I mean, they're not like <clears throat> probably the most clean guys, okay? Can you imagine dipping your hands into that last bowl, last, you know, the, the bowl, what it must have looked like on the last pair of feet? It must have not been pleasant. And he gets up and he goes, guys, I just want to say this to you. Number one, it's my pleasure to wash your feet. Number two, I just want you to always remember it. I want you to go and do the same thing. There's nothing too small, nothing too low in terms of serving someone. There's nothing too little. It's all about gaining and finding that same mindset and eyesight of Jesus. We can look at people. Maybe it would be better to look at them as your husband or your wife or, or your child or your grandchild and make it easier to do that. 
Or maybe you can just say, Jesus, help me to have your mindset. Mother Teresa also said this. She said, put yourself completely under the influence of Jesus so that he may think his thoughts in your mind, do his work through your hands, and for you to be all powerful with him to strengthen you. Allow him to do that for you. So I, let me just give, ask you a question, actually, before we go. I want you to think just for a moment. Um, how has Jesus been generous to you? And his generosity may have been through other people. I look at the money that was given to us that, to, to pay for bills and to do, the, do that, um, that we view, you know, as, as Jesus giving that to us. So it's over 350 hands. And it's, and it's overwhelming to, and it's humbling to, to go through that experience. But it's made me want to give to others whatever way I, I can. But how has Jesus been generous with you? Now, you may have to think about that for a while. Maybe it might be good to just write it down in front of you. I should probably put silent on this, right? I'd give myself a detention with that. Um, maybe today, maybe write down a few things. How's he been generous? And then just go out and be generous in the same way to someone else. That's the generosity you understand. How have some other people been generous? How have people been generous to you? And just say, okay, I'll just do that to someone else. When I feel that tug, I'll go with the tug. And I'll just do that to someone else. You know, <clears throat> I, I just, this morning, I opened, and this is one of those moments, I'm not lying, I opened up my Bible and it flopped open to Isaiah. Um, chapter 64, verse 7. I thought, I have to share this as I close. But now, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Jesus created us. God created us for wonderful, for his pleasure, because of his love. And he, and, and he wants us to experience all we possibly can in this world, which is a little bit different than like the American dream and things like that. And how we are with one another is so wonderful. Jesus modeled an open-handed generosity that has impacted all of us in, in a very real and profound way. And I don't know about you, but I'm so grateful for it. Let's pray. God, we love you. We love you so very much. And we're so grateful and thankful for the generosity that you have shown us, for the way that you have let us know that you are always going to be there for us. I thank you for the hundreds of people that have impacted my life, for the hundreds of people who have um, been a part of my journey, and, and for the privilege that I have been able to be a part of other people's journey. Father, help us just to, to begin to see things with your vision, to have your heart and to be aware of just what's going around us and, and allow you to tug us in those places where we can really touch people in a very generous, loving, and caring way. And we thank you for that gift. In your name we pray. Amen. I know for me it's hard for me to uh, be open to something when I'm holding on to something. If I'm holding on to um, my stuff, it's hard to let go of it. If I'm holding on to anger or bitterness, it's hard to let go of it and receive something new. It's just hard to, to even be generous if I'm just holding on to my schedule, to my priorities, to my money. This idea of opening your hand and approaching God that way, this way with generosity is something I want to encourage you to do this week and specifically right now. Just a moment, I'm going to invite you to go get your commun communion packets. And, and here's the thing. When you get this packet, they're by the doors if you haven't got them. Just a moment. The communion represents, the, the wafer represents his blood. The, the wafer represents his body broken on the cross. The, the juice represents his blood shed on the cross. And we're supposed to remember his sacrifice and thank him for that. But when you do that and thank him for that, it's supposed to be a call back to remembering what he's done for us. So I'm going to ask you, when you do your communion this time, would you practice just open your hands? Just open your hands. And, and pray to him with open hands. 
and in doing so, in your body posture, what you're saying is, I'm letting go of the stuff. I'm letting go of the fear. I'm letting go of the anger. I'm letting go of the insecurity. I'm letting go of, of, of where I find my security. I'm going to find it in you instead and just open your hands as you pray with them. 